Hi, this is Dan Limmer from Limmer Creative. I'm here to talk to you today about five tips for tuning up your EMS classroom. Many of you may have seen other webinars that I've done and know what I'm passionate about, and that is active learning. That is ways that we can get our students involved, ways that we can do less lecture and do more active processes. It might just be case studies. It might be problem-based learning. It might be any number of things. But that, I think, will form a framework for this while giving some new material um, with the overall goal, as we say, to come up with five tips for tuning up your EMS classroom. So welcome. I'd like to talk first about tradition. A lot of what we do uh, is based on tradition. If I were a student and then I became an instructor, I would probably go and teach the way my instructor did. I obviously would have been taught in my instructor coordinator class or my NEMSI educator class, but I think we do somehow base what we do on tradition and even organizational um, beliefs on how training is done. And I think that tradition has generally served us well, but I'd like to start uh, this concept, this presentation, by saying uh, I think that we can always improve. Now, using a whole part whole uh, way of doing this, I'm going to give you the five tips up front. And I don't think any of these are going to surprise you, but hopefully I can give you some good information as we go through. Number one, ditch the PowerPoints. Number two, match your student's lifestyle. Number three, have your students BYOD. That last letter is the key. You get that wrong, your class has got some problems. And uh, number four, change your lecture to active ratio. And number five, let the students teach. Perhaps that might be the most anticipated of these. Uh, we'll see as we go on. So number one, ditch the PowerPoints. Now, I don't really have to tell you uh, why we should do that, but it is very challenging to do. You know, PowerPoints can be interactive. Um, and it's easy. You know, we sometimes say, hey, can you do this lecture you know, for me? And the people say, oh, gee, I haven't prepared. And you say, well, I got the PowerPoints. You know, all the books come with them. Um, the PowerPoints are really designed to be a starting point. You know, a publisher, I mean, PowerPoints come with all my books, and I think we do okay. But no presentation is going to match your style, you know. So there is a reason that we call this death by PowerPoint. And uh, as you can see from the, the image, uh, what can sometimes happen. Now, there are good times we use PowerPoint. There are good things. Projecting art. I know that my drawing isn't particularly great. I do it, and I think students learn from it. So we can project anatomy art, we can project our slides onto a dry erase board, and then write on our slides. I do that a lot, especially when I have a big art piece up there. I want to talk about pneumothorax or something like that. I can put a piece of, of chest anatomy art up there, and I can teach from that. And that's different than a lot of bullet points. And then finally, you may decide to use PowerPoints. Uh, it can save you paper by uh, using custom presentations that you make to supplement your active learning things you do or even your problem-based learning. You want people to work on a case study or you want them to break into groups and, and work on questions. Put the questions on your projector, put them up there, don't have to hand out paper to everybody, and you can use that as an interactive way. I mean, so there are some ways that I think PowerPoint you know, can be good. They can guide you what to say. You know, like I said before, we can give instructions, present our cases, we can ask our students questions. You know, there are ways that we can make our slides interactive. But I think that many times it's easy to go with the default setting, especially when using, using a, a canned, uh, you know, pre-made presentation for something you're doing. I think that that is really um, more challenging than, than we would like. So what do we do instead? I guess I have to answer that question. If I say don't use PowerPoint, you know, what, what do we do? You know, I, I don't think that they're the best for learning. You know, when we say, well, I've got to go teach a class, we forget the difference sometimes between teaching and learning. That if I say I have to go teach a class, many times we just kind of assume that that's lecture. But it's not the best for the students to learn. Do you remember the, the overhead projector? I mean, if we go way, way back. You know, now we have computers and, and projectors, not trying to get into the, you know, in the old time EMS, we did this, but we used to get boxes of slides. My EMT book came with like 2,100 slides in a big yellow box, and you put those slides in the carousel and you couldn't even change them. Before that was the overhead projector. 
Now, while that doesn't seem particularly high tech, the nice thing about the overhead projector is you face the class and you can write on them. And, and strangely, I, I think in a way we're going back to that, that we need to, to face the class and not have the stuff on the screen and, and connect. What I do, my last paramedic class, as the paramedic class started, I used a few slides, not a ton, but as class went on, I used them less and less. What I found myself doing as I was preparing for the lecture, I had a big legal pad. And I would write all kinds of notes. I'd review Tintinale and, and Rosen's Emergency Medicine and Harrison's Internal Medicine and the class textbook. And I'd write everything out, kind of just in bullet points and notes and lists. And when I teach, I'd write on the dry erase board and I'd have this pad in my hand sometimes. Sometimes I wouldn't if I, if I you know, really remember. But that's what I would use. And I would write and I would teach. And it felt great. And I think, quite frankly, I think the students liked it better. And as I went farther and farther in the class, I put more time into these active processes. And I think that I enjoyed it more. I think my students enjoyed it more. And I think they learned better from it. So I think that, that going back to those things, I think, is, is better. Now, we've talked about the flipped classroom. And I think that this has a lot to do with that. Now, this source for these, I want to make sure that I credit these. These are from EdTech Magazine. And what they had a good article. They have a lot of good articles, actually. Um, on why 86% of University of North Carolina Chapel Hill students prefer a flipped classroom. And the, the, the secondary tagline is students spend more time discussing the application of learning content to their careers and less time scribbling notes. Application. You know, I think that's really what this is about. You know, and, and here's how it worked. They, they took a you know, professor and they went through and followed some of this. And the students like to be actively engaged, that they're talking, that they're doing things. They say that the flipped classroom builds knowledge and skills that's actually useful and practical for whatever their their major or career is or for us, so it's becoming an EMT or an AEMT or a medic. 86% of the students you know, preferred it, and uh, 9 out of 10 believe their learning was enhanced by it. And I think that's where we have to kind of change the whole concept um, of of what we believe we're doing when we're teaching and what happens when students are in fact learning. And I think that's really the concept of the flipped classroom and, and I think it's it's very important. Now, the uh, professor was Dr. Dr. Mumper and what he did is he recorded 25 lectures and each was just 35 minutes long. And we're gonna talk about how to do uh, audio and do video and things later in this presentation. But 25 lectures at 35 minutes long, I mean, it takes some time. It's an investment, and there's some preparation there. But I think the length is really good. You don't want to have four-hour videos or audios. They can be a giant size, and no one's going to pay attention that long. So when you flip the classroom, the concept is, is doing your homework in class and your classwork at home. The low-level cognitive stuff that you do for your reading, you can get in the videos and then work with your book. So they watched the videos before the class, and 97% watched more than 20 of the 25 lectures. I don't think you'd get that with your book. And then when students came into class, they had their book, they had watched the video, then they got to apply what they learned. I, I think it's a beautiful concept. And as it says on the screen here, it's about application. It's great to be able to come to class and not just sit there and passively take notes. We want our students to have a better clue in the field. We want them to think. We want to create better EMS providers so we need to do more than talk to them. We need to let them get involved and practice those things that we need them to do. So for a 75-minute class, the old-style lecture turns into 15 minutes of coming in and going over the stuff, um, asking questions, discussion, making sure the students don't have any, any problems or misunderstandings, introduction, how the things go with your recordings, then 15 minutes of open-ended questions, call it pair and share, uh, while working with their peers, and then 25 minutes of student presentations. We're going to talk later about having the student teach. It's not coincidence. This, this all kind of winds together in this presentation. That the students read and discuss a research topic, it's guided by the instructor. You know, the instructor is a facilitator in this, and students can come up and, and do things. You know, what do we do when we present something? You know, we prepare, and if a student has to present something, they're going to learn it. And I think that they're also not going to want to look poorly in front of their students. And then finally, there's a quiz. At the end, there's a quiz. I think one of the most important parts of any act of learning is not letting down on your tests. 
if you want your students to study, the best way you can do it is to give challenging exams. Don't back down on the exams because you're not lecturing. They're learning more in this. We could do higher level application questions when you use a flipped classroom model. And this is just one example. Obviously, a lot of our classes have longer times. We have, you know, two and a half, three, sometimes four hour classes. So we would obviously break things up differently. But the proportion, I think, here is really close uh, for our time. His grades went up. They went from 80 to 85 percent, a 5 percent uh, grade increase in the class. I think, that's, uh, I think that's very worthy of note. All right, moving on to number two. Make your class match your student's lifestyle. And I think that that's, that's important. I think we should, we should think about this and, and what that means. I think a lot of us are saying, why do we have to match our student's lifestyle? And I think the answer to that is, is because I think it gives us better education. Things fit them. They embrace it more. Um, it does go against tradition sometimes. Sometimes students are much more technically savvy, uh, technologically savvy, um, than the educators are. Because, well, I can't generalize. Students, they are more connected, even the older ones. They have multiple devices, not just one now. They're competent. Sometimes they're savvy. And they live with and buy tech. That that is, the, that is the way you do it. There's GPSs in the cars. There are computers. There are phones. There are tablets. And the prices are coming down. And the, and the software is getting better. I mean, it really is amazing, um, some of the things that, uh, that can be done uh, with this. All right. Um, it might not be that easy, you know, for us as educators. Um, sometimes we're not as savvy as our students are. I know when I come to uh, do trade shows and we do a booth for Limer Creative, a lot of times the instructors will come up and say, oh, no, my students, yeah, they don't have any tech. They don't use anything at all. And I like to say, well, what kind of phone do you have? And they pull out a flip phone that Verizon's been trying to get them to change out for years. And uh, in doing that, um, they, certainly, um, they certainly show that sometimes they don't understand. We can't stereotype, though. There are educators that are amazing technically way above their students, and there are students vice versa. We get that. But one thing I have to say here is that a certain level of tech competence is required in EMS in 2014 and beyond. If people aren't doing um, notebook computer or iPad-based uh, reporting for their PCRs, they're going to be. We're transmitting EKGs by telemetry. We are using technology and EMS, and I think our classrooms certainly should match up. So what can we do? Now, if you asked me, I made a quick list. I said, well, what could we use for technology? Well, we have podcasts like this one that can be just audio or they can be video. Uh, you can just make straight video, um, narrated PowerPoints. You can put PowerPoints up. If you want to make your take-home videos, you want to kind of make it easy. There's features in both uh, Keynote for, for Mac and, and PowerPoint where you can record voice to go with the slides and it actually changes the slides along and you can create something for students to watch for your homework. It doesn't have to be crazy, but, but there's more and we'll, and we'll talk about that. Now, some general concepts regardless of what you're going to do. Keep it relevant. Shorter bytes are generally better for a number of reasons. Attention span and file size. If you go on and on and on, if you do a 45-minute video, you're looking at hundreds of megabytes. It's harder to download. It's harder to store. People don't have um, the space on their devices sometimes to throw on you know, a gigabyte or two gigabytes of classroom lectures. We have to sometimes keep it tight. And so we say, be wary of the file size. Then finally, match the medium to the message. Sometimes audio is fine. And audio doesn't take a lot of space. It's easy to make. It's easy to edit. We'll talk about that. And people can put it in their device. They've got headphones on all the time anyways and can listen to that. But some things might be skill-based. Maybe you make your own videos. So match the medium to the message. Some things are visual. Some things aren't. Sometimes the having a visual component is better. And other times it doesn't make a difference. So podcast recording just for audio. Um, about $59 and up on Amazon. You'll see an example I put up on your screen there. Um, that's about $89 there. It's got headphones, plug it into your computer and listen. It's got the, the screen that you put over to keep the tss and the p out there. Mine is marginally successful. 
the stuff that you record will be recorded right into your computer's hard drive and then you'll very easily be able to edit it either in a program that comes with your computer um, GarageBand for Mac um, Audacity is a free uh, app uh, which can be used for Macs and PCs like I said students are listening to stuff a lot students are driving a long time in their car on the way to and from class so when you know they have they have clinicals so having something that they can listen to that you can control that really matches what you do and supports your class isn't really difficult uh, and it's very beneficial to the students so try not to make it boring outline it don't script it if you're reading they can just about read their book I mean reading to them doesn't do it they want insights so give them an outline it might take a couple of takes or a little bit of editing but outline it don't script it find a quiet place with minimal interruptions I am um, recording this uh, right now uh, with my phone on vibrate the house phone is the ringer is turned off as I said here I'm keeping my fingers crossed that no other sounds come on but it's important to do that I've got a podcast microphone sitting here in my desk my slides are right in front of me and I'm recording this now minimize other noise for example if you have papers in front of you that you want to that you want to uh, use for reference that's okay but spread them out nobody wants to hear this kind of thing while people are fooling around with papers and then choose a chair that doesn't squeak and if you're using video make a chair that doesn't move nothing worse than watch somebody on video spinning around in their chair or on audio hearing it squeak now use cloth and carpet to improve your sound if you're in a room that doesn't have a lot of uh, curtains and doesn't have a carpet uh, you're gonna get a hollow echoey sound I'm gonna show you some of the things that I did Joe Mistovich and I went down to, to Florida did some audio recording this is a more advanced setup that I have with two microphones a small mixing board and I put a bedspread over the table and I piled pillows up on both sides of us and you can see how we how we have that I also put bedspreads on the walls behind both of us now Joe's voice is very booming compared to mine so I had to adjust the audio because we were different but basically when it projected past me it hit that that big bedspread that I had clamped to the wall you know two doors and it made this so there was less of an echo in the room and it makes a very big difference in the sound. Now, you don't have to get crazy. I know some people that take just a big beach towel and they drape it over their computer monitor and they put it around the side of them and like they're in a little tent while they're recording. But you don't have to get that, that crazy. But try the sound and see what happens. I think you'll find it's very beneficial. Now, for uh, lecture capture, for the ability for you to draw something on an iPad, for example, I'll use iPad as an example. I have an iPad. We're trying to find stuff um, for um, Android tablets and, and other things. Um, this is my favorite app, but there's a lot of things uh, out there. This is inexpensive. Look at the icon on the, on the right side of your screen there. That's the icon for it, because if you put in lecture capture, you're going to get about 75 hits, so all the things for students to record lectures in class. This one, what it does is allows you to draw on the screen of your iPad, and it saves it as a video. Why I like lecture capture is that it's inexpensive, but it lets you save the file wherever you choose. There's other apps out there which are very dynamic, but what they do is they save them on their server and want to link to them. I want them to be saved right to my right to my computer, and then I can upload it wherever I choose to do. I think it's very easy and it's a very simple, uh, you know, recording process um, in this. So, what I have is I have a video. And I'm gonna just play this video for you this is what the screen of my iPad looks like I just put a picture on there and then I went and I drew so by by drawing on there it saves it as a video you can put anatomy art up there you can put a photo up there you know whatever you want and then draw on that and explain things so now I'll show you how I put in um, how I made a video which just just very simple as an example explains how a bag valve mask works and I want to show you here that the problems with mask seal often happen here at the chin and along the sides of the mask right here. The thumbs are going to be up on the, the, the nose, and many times that's held down, but our problem spots uh, are here. So many times we use the EC method. Now here's the C, and here is the E. And what the E does is it keeps the face pushed up to the mask, 
and then the C pushes the mask down on the face. And you see, because we have two rescuers here, rescuer one, rescuer two. So that's the video demo. That's it. It's very simple. You can write on the screen. You can talk. It's all recorded. Uh, it's very, very effective. All right. Last thing I'm doing, uh, I'm recording this right now via uh, an app called Camtasia. I did this as a uh, webinar last week, but the sound was horrible and it didn't work particularly well. So now what I'm doing is I have my computer uh, my my slides on the screen. I'm doing a screen capture and I'm recording in the background and I'm putting this together so so we can do this. Basically, it allow you to take your slides or take photographs and it will basically video a portion of your computer screen and let you narrate over it. So that's how this is happening. It's called Camtasia. There's a couple options for this out there. I find this very simple and easy to use. Uh, it's $99, um, $79 for the um, educator version of it. So it saves you 20 bucks since, since we're in education. Uh, we certainly can't, uh, can't you know, shake a stick at saving 20 bucks. So Camtasia will allow you to record audio over this. And you could, you know, you can take, you'll see my mouse coming across the screen here um, that you can actually record if you're on a website. You can do anything. Uh, and it's, it's pretty full featured. I, I, uh, I like it. So number three, have your students bring their own device. This is a new trend in education. The, the National Association of EMS Educators actually put something out about this uh, in their newsletter that got me to EdTech uh, magazine. And BYOD is bring your own device. So like I said, don't screw up uh, the device part. If they're bringing their own something else, it might just get ugly. So we've been very hesitant to let students use their devices in class because it's a distraction or they're watching stuff they shouldn't do it. The, the current theory out there is not to prevent it, it's to take control of it and give them something legitimate to do with it. Now, you, students will still give you trouble. When I have my students research, I, I walked over, I found one guy doing his firehouse scheduling. And he, you know, oh, I got to get this done. And I said, well, I take somewhat of a, of a liberal approach to things. And the way I handled it was, this is your choice. But if you fail the exam for the stuff that you're supposed to be doing now, don't say you want extra credit and don't say you want to make this up. And don't blame my exam because you're not paying attention. Now, obviously, he closed it down. And I think the message was delivered, but sometimes things like that are enough just to, you know, to make it happen. I think anything we do uh, comes down to consistency and application. If we have a policy, apply it consistently, make it a good policy, uh, and, then, and then go with it. Now, there's a lot of things that we can do uh, for this. Medical reference, uh, research, um, we can use that to access tech textbooks, problem-based learning, uh, exam preparation and review. It's not coincidence we have a picture of our website there, lc-ready.com, um, and uh, for preparing presentations. If we have our students actually going to do presentations as part of class, they'll use a device to, to be part of that. But how students use it is much different than we would use it. It's really, really amazing. So is there more? Yeah, there actually is. The Sun Prairie Area School District, I uh, searched BYOD. So what did I find? One of the top hits was Sun Prairie Area School District. Now, you'd think this would be somewhere in the southwest, you know. I was thinking New Mexico, Arizona. No, it turns out it's in Wisconsin. They have a BYOD policy. And on the front of the page that talks about this, for students, school is like an airplane. They're told to remain seated, locate the exits, and stow their electronics. I guess even airlines are, are better than that now. But they believe that things should be in the classroom. They've brought a, a BYOD policy into the school district in which 400 students a day approximately connect to their wireless internet. They find that there's less cell phone discipline necessary, that there's increased responsibility of uh, the students, and they use it more for instructional purposes, that they've embraced it and they believe that it's successful. So now students, if you ask a student what to do versus an educator, if we said to a student, you know, you need to do a presentation on traction splitting, they'd probably take their phone and make a video. I mean, for us that have been doing this for a long time, you'd never think about making a video, but you can make a video from your phone and drop it right into a presentation if you choose to and show it. What students do when they're allowed to be creative um, and they have a good instructor facilitator um, is pretty amazing because they can make their own video and audio recordings. They do that stuff more naturally than we do. 
take photographs to put in their presentations, access websites, polls, flip classroom. There's a lot of stuff on your screen, you know, storing stuff in the cloud. And there's a lot of great educational apps, you know. And how many times do we have an online uh, portal where they can get their grades and assignments and things? Yet we don't use let them use devices in class. So number four, change your lecture to active ratio. Now, I, this isn't a big surprise. I talk about this all the time. But the belief that we have to teach, you know, teach is in quotes there, is fundamentally flawed. That teach means lecture. And I don't think, I think that's where the flaw comes in is that there's better ways to teach and there's better ways for students to learn. But you don't have to do it all at once. You don't have to suddenly say, you know, gee, I listened to, you know, to Limmer or you listen to any other educators who are out there talking about this stuff around the country. You've been to the NEMSI educator class and see some of the things that they do. It's, it's a, people love that class. So there's a lot of different ways to do things. But remember, it's going to take a while for you to make the videos or the audios that people are going to listen to outside of class and come up with the assignments and do that. So you can start slowly. You know, it's okay. But what it looks like when it's done, our expectations are different. We expect them to do some classwork at home. Listen to audios, watch videos, read the book, maybe do some assignments, fill out some things, do some application assignments you send home. Then you bring them into class you can take at home. I mean, look at seating. We have people that are traditionally all sitting in the class looking up at us. Well, here they're sitting in a lot of different places and groups and they're working, having activities. This particular activity I have a photo of here is near the end of my paramedic class. Uh, we kind of straddled the, the, the time of year a little bit. We had a summer EMT class starting in, you know, before my paramedic class ended. So we had the EMTs come up with questions they wanted to ask an experienced EMS person. I had my paramedics write five things they'd like to tell a new EMT and got them together. What could go wrong, huh? So everything changes, the activities, the outcomes, but I think it's a beautiful thing. There's times we feel like we're walking without a safety net. There's times that we say, man, you know, this is kind of crazy because it feels comfortable teaching because you know they're getting all the material but they actually get all the material. We still give them exams and set our expectations, but the course is better and more dynamic and more exciting when we use more uh, of an active process. So number five, let the students teach. Let you just pause here for a second and say, what is Limmer thinking? You know what? I mentioned this earlier. You know, what do you do uh, when you present? Well, you check your notes and you review and you make sure you know it cold and, you know, isn't that what you want from our students? Now, we have to be a facilitator. We don't just say, okay, next week I want you to teach, you know, uh, the Krebs cycle for me. We give them a topic that's, that's bite-sized. They can prepare. They give to the students that they can teach to the rest of the class. And then we help them as it goes. Some of the time we do is, okay, I want everybody to work on your presentation. I'm going to be here to ask questions. And you go to your students. All right, what's your do? Because they're going to need focusing. Students don't always know what to do. So these brief topics that the students teach. I had all my students do a case presentation, you know, of course, with, you know, HIPAA sensitive, uh, you know, uh, approach to it. But all my students did presentations. I asked them to not only just talk about the case, but how it applies to class and what they've learned and what insights they learned from it. It was a great experience uh, for me, and I think they enjoyed it too. I think it's important in class to do that. So if you watch what students do, um, they probably do things differently than we would. You know, do they create PowerPoints? Do they write on the board? Do they create a video? Well, how does this come full circle in this presentation? Are they going to do what you do? They've watched you teach, so they're going to do the same thing. They've got a lot of them have computers, right? So they're going to get PowerPoint or Keynote up there, and they're going to make some slides and go up and do a presentation. But if you teach differently, they may teach differently, and that may change the tradition. You're still needed. I think this is a good slide to kind of bring it home with that in the more active you get in what you do, it doesn't have to be full blown problem based learning. There's a, I did a podcast on that, a, web, a webinar on that recently. I think that is, is a very cool thing. I think it's where the future is going. That can fit in the flipped classroom model. There's a lot of things we do. But regardless, even if you switch from an educator mode to a facilitator mode, it's still vitally important. 
You advise the students. You're making sure they're getting it. That, that facilitator role, I think you may find, is actually much more satisfying when you watch the students succeeding. I think it's really great. All right, I'm winding down here. It's the last slide. My email is on there, Dan Limmer. I've had the good fortune to have been an EMS for about 35 years and uh, write a bunch of books and uh, started this company called Limmer Creative. You can reach me at dan at limmercreative.com. We've got 20 apps out. You'll see some of them uh, in icons there on the left side of your screen. Um, Sarah McCabe is our sales manager. You can reach her at the number on your screen, 207-482-0622, extension number 2. We give discounts for class adoptions and purchases of multiple apps. We'd love to talk to you uh, more about this. And you can find out more at our website, limmercreative.com. So this is Dan Limmer thanking you very much uh, for your attention, and I hope you're able to stop by for another one of our presentations. Thank you.